Thank you very much, Claire. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and thank you and uh, Brian and the rest of the organisers of the Light Stuff Lectures for having me on. Um, it's, it's fantastic to be here and continuing what's been a really good series over the summer, over, over the last few months of this year. Um, I'm, uh, as, as Claire introduced, I'm Dr. Hamish Young. Um, I'm a lecturer, which is equivalent to assistant professor at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, and my research uh, covers a broad range of topics. And um, in the next few slides, when I share them, I'll uh, introduce them a little bit more. Uh, let's have a go at sharing the screen. Thank you for coming to this talk. Um, it's uh, good to be here on a Friday afternoon. My talk's about formation and heterostructure control in metal organic frameworks. And I'm going to tell you two little stories. Um, the first, predominantly about formation of MOFs, uh, metal organic frameworks. And the second one, about how we might be able to control heterostructures and the insights that we've gained using crystallographic techniques and um, a lot of in situ X-ray diffraction at synchrotrons over the last few years. Uh, you can see more details about my research and, and these uh, stories at the website down in the bottom uh, left corner and I'm um, also on Twitter there as well. Before I start about the science, um, I'd just like to introduce a little bit about me. Um, I started my scientific training, I suppose, um, in Cambridge, where I stayed about 10 years in the end, uh, ending up in uh, Anthony Cheatham's group, doing a PhD in material science and a, and a brief postdoc there. Then I traveled right across the world to Japan and uh, took up a post as an ICYS, that's International Center for Young Scientists, researcher in their National Institute for Material Science. And that was quite an eye-opener in many ways. Um, it gave me an experience of a different country, a different culture, a different research culture, um, and enabled me to meet a whole host of different people from across the globe as well. And then I came back to the UK um, uh, to a fellowship uh, mentored by uh, Andrew Goodwin in Oxford in inorganic chemistry, and uh, now, as of about a year ago, I've been a lecturer in materials chemistry in the University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, I'm also interested in various other things outside of science, um, including some fairly, fairly uh, mundane things like walking and food, um, but also things like mental health and, and diversity in science and, and research as well. My group's research covers a, a broad range of topics with, with kind of primary interests in how materials form and how they're organized and how that organizational structure affects their response. And so a lot of the work we do overlaps between these different themes. And I'm gonna talk about metal organic frameworks um, for the rest of this talk, but just to highlight a few other areas uh, we've, we've been involved in using metal-organic frameworks for sensing, um, in particular nanoparticles and the response when they absorb uh, small molecules uh, and, and uh, swell or contract can lead to a sensing, sensing response. And we're also interested in other types of materials like perovskites and hybrid perovskites in particular and understanding the design principles that underlie their behavior as, for example, ferroelectrics. And also, we, we use uh, high-pressure X-ray diffraction to understand the structures of molecular conductors uh, as they're squeezed under high pressure and, and change their electrical properties. In this case, um, becoming from a, a semiconductor or insulator to a semi-metal property with, with flat uh, temperature dependence in the resistivity. And all, all of these projects uh, require a lot of collaboration um, across the world. In fact, uh, the, the first uh, metal organic sensing project involved researchers back in, in Japan uh, at NIMS. Uh, the, the middle one was a great collaboration between theorists and experimentalists. So Andrew Goodwin and Nick Bristow, uh, who was at Kent, did, did DFT that really underpinned a lot of the work. And, and over here, the molecular conductor work is, is in collaboration with scientists at Riken in Japan. Um, and, and that's probably a, a big theme of my work, work as, as you'll see. Um, we don't just work alone as, as science is uh, global and international and we can connect with people so well through the internet these days. It, it becomes a really rewarding endeavor 
to, to collaborate. But I want to talk about our work on metal organic frameworks today, and uh, that's one in particular that will come up uh, a few times in this talk. It's called ZIF8, Zeolitic Imidazolate Framework Number 8, and uh, its chemical composition is one zinc atom to two uh, linkers of two methyl imidazolates. Now, metal organic frameworks are connected uh, metal nodes with organic linkers connecting them. And, and this picture of ZIF8 here on the left-hand side uh, is just one part of the structure. And if you were to extend it further and further by connecting the blue tetrahedra, which are the zinc-based nodes, uh, using the organic linkers, the, the imidazolate linkers, uh, in three dimensions, you'd get an extended structure. And these structures have pores in the middle. You, you can probably see right in the middle of that cage, there's a, about a nanometer sized pore. And that's quite typical of MOFs. Um, and that's led to record breaking surface areas with uh, many different applications. And because you can use different metal ions and met different organic linkers, that means that you could uh, envisage so many different uh, combinations and, in fact, Thousands upon thousands of structures have been reported in the CSD, the Cambridge Structural Database, which is a repository for these sorts of materials. Um, they've already got commercial applications, even uh, since they were really discovered and, and research shot off about two or three decades ago. They've already got commercial applications and many other potential applications, so in sensing and catalysis, separations, water pu purification, uh, energy storage, microelectronics have all been touted and investigated quite heavily. And if you want more information and kind of a, a, a broad overview on what's kind of hot, e even now in metal organic frameworks, I direct you to this um, themed issue in ChemSoc Rev that was published quite a few years ago now, but it still um, gives you really good insight into what's going on. But, um, where next? Where, where's the future of MOFs? If, if we've already discovered loads of materials or if we've already investigated them for loads of applications, what might we want to do next with them? Uh, are, they, are they a dead end now or, or is there more to do? Well, um, I hopefully show you that they're not a dead end and there's a lot more interesting chemistry and structural work um, and diversity that we can uh, gain. In particular, if you take this structure of ZIF-8, it's just contained it just contains one metal atom and one organic linker. But if you were to say mix different uh, components, different metals or different linkers, and here's an example in the middle of uh, MOF5 derivative with uh, many different linkers in cartoon form, you might envisage being able to tailor every single pore, maybe in slightly different ways, to get really uh, tunable functionality in terms of the chemistry and pore size and pore shape that can uh, give different properties like size selectivity for uh, for sensing or for catalysis even. And if you go another step further in, a, in your imagination, you could imagine creating uh, active sites like you see in enzymes. In this case, uh, this is a model of Rubisco, which is responsible for uh, abstracting pretty much all the carbon dioxide down from the atmosphere in plants. Um, and uh, what, what enzymes have to their advantage, uh, and they've evolved over, over millennia, is this, these active sites, which are uh, chemically functional, uh, highly specific little pockets, which, uh, which promote catalysis or uh, selectivity over small molecules that enter there. And we can imagine by mixing different components in a metal organic framework, maybe we can do the same. Um, but at the moment, our synthetic methodology, our synthetic skills, uh, are, are just not quite there yet. We don't have control over where those functionalities sit. Yes, we can, we can mix them a lot of the time in, in different MOF structures, but, but it's still very challenging to, to control that and also to characterize it as, as I'll show. Um, so the first story that I want to tell is, is about how we've been using in situ X-ray diffraction, uh, principally at synchrotrons, to uncover some more information about how these materials form, how they crystallize. And, and it's a paper that was published just last year um, called Control of Metal Organic Framework Crystallization by Metastable Intermediate Pre-Equilibrium Species. And that's quite a mouthful, but I hope it will become clear as this talk goes on. So unsurprisingly, because they're 
quite uh, an interesting area with lots of researchers working uh, in meta-organic frameworks have been investigated already in terms of how they form. And, and one of the uh, mechanisms that by which they form, largely speaking in nanoparticle form, um, is, is this one. And this, this picture is taken from, from a, a really neat paper uh, a few years back in crystal growth design. And, and the thinking goes that we start off with little complexes, and these might be uh, isolated metal ions that are solvated by whatever solvent you have. Um, and then you have clusters and amorphous particles that grow gradually as the organic linker links the metal ions or metal nodes together. And from these amorphous particles, from the middle of them, we start to form the crystalline domains. And these crystalline domains are, are domains where we get the ordered structure that goes into the metal-organic framework that we see in the end. And the amorphous particles are, are metal-organic uh, linkages, but they might not have that uh, very, very ordered structure that we're familiar with. Um, and as these crystallite domains grow, you might form nanocrystals. So these are crystals of the size of, of several nanometers um, in, in one, two or three dimensions. And then gradually as the reaction proceeds, maybe they aggregate together. So um, there have been various studies using a whole host of different methods to elucidate some of these features. But it really is a challenge because you're going from length scales that span mole molecules to, to potentially micron or even centimeter size uh, aggregates, uh, it's a real challenge to use one method in, uh, alone to, to characterize these. And that's why really we still don't have much of a feel of what factors really affect MOS synthesis. And what we'd really like to be able to do is start to predict what synthesis parameters do to this uh, formation process. So if we change the pH, can we promote it? Can we get different phase behavior? Can we do the same with temperature or pressure or different concentrations? And it turns out that actually, if you've been trying to crystallize MOFs um, in, in the past, it's, quite, it's often quite a finicky process. Um, it's hard to really predict. Even small changes um, or even large changes, it's hard to predict how they will come out in the end. So that's a, that's a motivation for our work. And uh, the methods that we use typically rely on monitoring these reactions in situ. And the benefits of using in situ monitoring are that you're actually probing the reactions as they're happening. And if you weren't to do that, and maybe you were to take snapshots of your reaction by taking aliquots of the solution out and then uh, drying them and measuring them, say, ex situ x-ray diffraction after after that drying process or taking them out of the reaction maybe you start to change the the form of the material that you're analyzing so it's not really representative of what's actually in there at any given time so um that's that's the advantage of doing it in situ the challenge actually is that many of these reactions are incompatible with your conventional uh, monitoring techniques. So if we want to do x-ray diffraction, we need to go to a synchrotron where they've got very high energy, very high flux of x-rays to penetrate through our reaction vessels. So in, in this case, it's a big aluminium block with a, um, a small test tube containing the solution that, from which crystallize the metal organic frameworks. And, and we fire our x-rays through there and we detect them on the other side and we detect the scattering. And from that scattering, um, using some, some computational um, modeling and, and uh, clever analysis, we can work out what's, uh, what crystalline materials are in there and how much they are at any given time. We also complement this with uh, laboratory turbidity measurements. So these typically probe particle uh, nucleation, particle formation. And um, we, we complement it with pH measurements that probe the change in acidity, the release of protons, and the, the molecular chemistry on the smaller length scale than the X-ray diffraction can probe as well. So when we combine all of these measurements, we start to get a, a better picture of what's going on in the solutions. So coming back to our uh, canonical ZIF-8 material, um, we typically form it by uh, reacting one zinc ion with four equivalents of methylimidazole, so MIM, with H, which is the proton that exists on there um, in its normal state. And they react together to 
in theory, give you ZF8, which has two equivalents of methylamidazole. And um, what happens in our reactions is that some of the methylamidazoles that's in there uh, actually are uh, bases. They, they abstract the protons from the methylamidazoles that go into the eventual crystalline product ZF8. And uh, not too surprisingly, this, this reaction has been studi studied in quite a lot of detail over even the last decade. And, and one of the ways we can do this is by measuring the X-ray diffraction, um, measuring the amount of crystalline material we've got, and trying to plot these and model them as a function of time according to established models. And one of these established models here uh, is the Avrami equation or the JMAC equation, because several people have, have uh, come up with this. And um, what it essentially tells you is A, uh, alpha, which is the degree of crystallization, as a function of time, which is T. And there are two parameters that you're modeling it with. K is a rate constant for crystal growth, and N is a, an exponent. So this N, loosely speaking, tells you something about the mechanism of the crystallization process. And um, so, so that can give you an idea of how different reactions compare. Maybe one has a faster rate constant than the other. So you can say, yes, it's crystallizing faster. Or if N changes, maybe the mechanism of crystallization is changing. And I'm going to highlight two little studies that have been done before. And they're both really valid in their own rights. But they highlight the, the differences that might come from different, uh, different scenarios. And the first is... Uh, uh, an ex situ X-ray diffraction uh, study that was published about a decade ago, um, and and this gives you quite a sigmoidal curve, an S-shaped curve in the crystallization profile, and this delay here um, and the sharp increase in the crystallinity gives an exponent n of about four, and that indicates that we've got a kind of conventional um, crystal growth mechanism, whereas more recently an in situ X-ray diffraction experiment using different conditions gave an exponent of about n equals 0 0.6 and and it does seem like both are completely valid um both that there seems like there's reason behind the difference in mechanism but it's not absolutely clear how we might be able to predict why why these differences occur and so that's where we came in and we conducted a study where we were a bit more systematic about uh, the different conditions that we, we proved. And we used in situ X-ray diffraction, and you'll see the X-ray diffraction patterns as a function of time on the left here. Two theta is the diffraction angle, uh, which we measure in our detector at the synchrotron, and time up the left uh, is increasing in, in seconds. And um, the different peaks that come in are all corresponding to our crystalline material, ZIF8. And that's quite nice to know. We know that there's only ZIF8 in there and there's no other crystalline intermediates. So we're crystallizing everything essentially directly from solution, maybe via some intermediate species. What then became interesting is when we start to play around with the conditions and when we started to increase the concentration of zinc while keeping the one to four ratio of zinc to imidazole, we noticed something slightly strange happening. Um, and by highlighting one of the peaks um, for each of these different reaction concentrations going up in concentration, we see we see a more intense peak uh, eventually, and that signifies we've got more crystalline material. But we also see a delay that increases as a, as concentration increases. And if you think to a classical model of crystallization, if you increase concentration, you might well expect to increase the rate of nucleation of crystal growth and therefore increase uh, crystallinity much faster. But we have the opposite happening here. And so we can't really explain our uh, results with a standard conventional uh, model of crystallization. Uh, we can start to fit these, these data with our um, Avrami equation to get a rate constant for crystal nucleation and rate constant for crystal growth. And indeed, those rate constants that we uh, can quantify decrease as a function of, um, of uh, concentration.
The way that we've been able to explain this is by the existence of a pre-nucleation equilibrium, um, and it contains several different species, and I'll go through this in a minute. But, but really, the, the main point is that it's not a linear mechanism of crystallization. In fact, it's highly dependent on the concentration, on the conditions, and that's as people have found in the past and as we found in our results too. So this pre-nucleation uh, state consists of a few different series of equilibria. The first is a coordination equilibrium where from left to right we're adding imidazole species uh, from one, two, three, and four. And, and over here we've got zinc, which is tetrahedral by nature, coordinated by four imidazole species. And each of these equilibria, we've simplified to say, has one equilibrium constant and therefore uh, just, just this, these two variables of rate constants, k, small kc and small k minus c for the forwards and backwards processes. There's also a series of deprotonation equilibria which go from top to bottom and up, up the top every imidazole is protonated but if we take one off at a time and then another off, we end up with a species uh, like this one at the bottom which has two methylimidazoles to every zinc and two solvents as well, but the methylimidazole um, species are deprotonated. And that is the um, same stoichiometry, aside from the solvent molecules, that eventually goes in to our crystalline ZIF8 material. And so in our simple model, we, we take this as our crystallizing species, and we use two more rate constants for crystal growth, K1 and K2, which represent a kind of autocatalytic model for crystallization. A kind of equivalent to nucleation and growth for K1 and K2, but not quite. Um, and that and that means we end up with just really just uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different rate constants. And if we look in the literature, we can find some values for for these, and that actually simplifies down to just a few different parameters with which we can uh, model our crystallization. Does it really work in, in, in practice? Well, over here on the left-hand side, we've fitted the X-ray diffraction data um, and plotted the different uh, crystallization curves as a function of concentration. And indeed, we see this uh, inhibition of crystallization, this delay period increasing as a function of concentration. And in our calculations from this model, um, using uh, a fairly judicious selection of rate constants here at the bottom, we indeed see that suppression of crystallization and the delayed crystallization when we increase our concentration. The same goes for pH. Um, when, when we initially mix the reaction, we get a really sudden decrease in the pH. And then a plateau as the, as the pre-nucleation pre -nucleation equilibrium kind of stabilizes. And then once we get crystallization going again, we see a decrease again after that. Um, and indeed, in our calculation, we, we see a similar rapid decrease plateau and then a decrease again. And the length of that plateau uh, signifies how long that pre-nucleation equilibrium is stable for. And that uh, is, is longer for higher concentration reactions, as we find in the experiments. We get a longer plateau there. We also see some interesting features in the particle size data. Um, and uh, here, again, in contrast to our classical uh, expectation, as we increase the concentration of zinc, we actually also increase the average particle size. And that's seen in SEM data. It's also seen in the um, high resolution X ray diffraction data we've got. And why might that be? Um, well, we can look back to our model and, and plot as a function of time the different concentrations of our intermediate species. And what I want to draw your attention to is this y equals 4, the 4-coordinate imidazole species um, here. And at low concentrations, it's stable for a fairly short time, whereas at high concentrations, that time, that plateau that we saw in the pH is, is far extended. And the result is there that the growth period uh, the growth compared to the nucleation rate um, is, is much bigger in terms of in the high concentration reactions. So overall, we can start to um, understand the effect of different synthesis parameters. Um, and at low concentrations where we have under coordination and an additive mechanism, that results in fast crystallization. And that's because this 
addition, uh, uh, this addition of imidazoles is quite fast relative to pulling them off again. And this also works well with basic conditions where we go from top to bottom very quickly. We get deeper in protonation. Whereas in contrast, if we've got high concentrations, we push this equilibrium on the top to the right to these over-coordinated species. Um, that can also happen with poorly coordinating solvents or counter ions, and then we get over-coordination. And then when we want to form our crystallizing species here, we have to start taking imidazoles off. That's an eliminative mechanism, and that slows down crystallization, which can also happen if we've got acidic co conditions, which prevent us going from top to bottom of this equilibrium. In summary, um, I, just in summary of this part of the talk, ZIF formation begins with a dynamic pre-equilibrium of complexes, and we've got evidence from X-ray diffraction, pH, and turbidity to support that model. And this gives us a new basis with which to predict and explain the effects of synthesis parameters on ZIF crystallization. Um, we might be able to exploit that in the future to discover new phases and, and improve things like scale-up for industrial purposes. The second part of my talk, and I'm, I'm conscious that I've got five minutes left, so this is going to be a whirlwind tour, is a second uh, paper with, um, in collaboration with Sean Collins and Kieran Orr um, on the st single step synthesis and tuning of the interface of core shell metal organic nanoparticles. And this, this relates to um, mixed component metal organic frameworks. And I already showed this cartoon on the left. If we start to mix different components in a MOF, then uh, we, form, we might form solid solutions, but actually it turns out it's quite difficult to control how homogeneous they are. On the other hand, if you mix different components but they phase separate, you could actually form quite a functional material, um, and the Kitagawa group in, in Japan have, have really pioneered this over the last decade, where maybe you have a core that, that um, has a big capacity for small molecules, but a shell that uh, acts as a size-selective um, membrane, or maybe the core is a reactive uh, catalytic core or, a, or a, has the ability to sense things. Um, now, this has been demonstrated on a micro, uh, micron scale, but um, as you decrease the size of these things, which is what you might want to do to increase the diffusion rate through any given particle, um, that becomes very complicated to synthesize um, and also to characterize. So, so these are our kind of challenges if we want to make very tunable mixed component MOFs is how do we characterize them and how do we start to predict their structures? And it all starts with uh, ZIF8 again, where my student a few years back, Adam Sapnik, uh, started to mix cadmium in there. And cadmium can be tetrahedral just like zinc. And it turns out we can make nice solid solutions where as we increase the cadmium fraction, we also increase the unit cell length because of the larger size of cadmium. Um, but it also turns out that they're not homogeneously distributed. They're not completely random. In fact, you form small regions where you've got cadmium-rich ZIF8 and small regions where you have zinc-rich ZIF8. <clears throat> so the question arose, can we actually control this heterogeneity um, and what length scales this might happen at? And what's the effect of then trying to change the synthesis parameters? Can we tune that heterogeneity? So um, my student, uh, Kieran Orr, a, few year, a couple of years back now in, in Oxford, did a systematic study of, of this reaction. He conducted 99 different reactions uh, over 24 hours as a function of uh, the composition of the reaction, so the amount of cadmium in the reaction mixture and temperature. And at diamond beamline I11, you can collect really beautiful high-resolution synchrotron X-ray diffraction patterns. And um, from these, we, we can look at the peak shape, which uh, is surprisingly asymmetric. It's, it's not a very nice peak shape by conventional standards. And that suggests we've got a quite condition-dependent heterogeneity um, when, when you look at um, a measure of that asymmetry here on, on the right-hand side, we get a various different values of it. And a standard analysis of X-ray diffraction is quite insufficient to resolve these spatial distributions, so we can't get much further than that just yet. So we turned to Sean Collins, who's an expert in uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, and he took some really beautiful images um, of our particles. And what he showed was that 
these particles have a cadmium-rich core surrounded by a zinc-rich shell. Um, and so it seems like our shorter synthesis, instead of giving us quite a homogeneous uh, mixture of zinc and cadmium, gives us core shell nanoparticles. Now, uh, scanning transition electron microscopy is quite expensive and time consuming. So since we had 99 samples to go through, um, we wondered if we could extract a bit more information from that. And uh, the way we did it was to uh, come up with a compositional gradient model. Um, there's a bit of maths uh, on the right, and that basically says that our lattice parameter of any uh, particle as a function of the radius of that particle, um, we, we model as a lattice parameter at the interface between the core and the shell, um, plus the range of lattice parameters times this function here, which uh, relies on the diffuseness of the interface, this new, and the interface radius where it is in that shell. Um, for more details, I, I'll send you to, to the paper that we've put on the CHEM archive for now. Does this model make any sense? Well, if we compare it to a split, split peak single phase model or a two phase uh, standard crystal refinement, it compares pretty favorably with them, but we've also got some meaningful physical data um, about our particles. It also seems to um, model the high peaks, the peaks which are most asymmetric, better than, than, than either of those two models, notably with fewer fitting parameters. There are just five in that model that I um, told you about. Um, and that enables us to look at each sample individually and uh, plot that composition as a function of the radius. Um, and these are the, the data from a selection of them, uh, different reaction compositions, different uh, cadmium fractions, and as a function of the radius, our composition X. And what we see indeed is that we have this core shell composition. So we have a cadmium rich shell and a zinc rich, uh, sorry, a cadmium rich core and a zinc rich shell there. And the interface in between them that may be quite sharp in some cases, but in others, it may be quite diffuse. And, and our model seems to capture that quite well. There's also some, comp, uh, some temperature dependence, especially at the low reaction compositions where we can tune that uh, position and the diffuseness of that interface between the cadmium-rich core and the zinc-rich shell. We also see that particle size increases uh, as the cadmium fraction increases as well. So um, that's in keeping with the previous observations. And with these data, we can start to make little maps of our structure as a function of the reaction conditions. Um, and that will enable us to, in principle, predict what structures might result from what uh, synthesis conditions and give us that degree of control that we're really after. It also gives us an idea of the possibilities and limits of this method, which is just single step. We mix everything in together and rely on something about the reaction to, to give us core shell structures. So we can map out uh, the interface radius as a function of the conditions or the difference in the core shell composition, and that translates um, to the difference in the pore size within the different uh, parts of the structure, and also the diffuseness, how, how integrated the core and the shell are. Um, what I then became really interested in was, well, how, how do we form these core shell man nanoparticles? They seem to be a kinetic phenomenon because we're happening at, um, at de decreased timescales. So we turn back to in-situ X-ray diffraction at diamond beamline I-12 again, and we see the, these characteristic peaks from Ziffe appearing as a function of time. And what's quite notable is that we see initially two different uh, sets of peaks. Um, one peak that uh, one set of peak that forms first happens at lower two theta, which means you've got an expanded unit cell, which means it's cadmium rich. And then a little bit after that, we see a series of peaks that have a higher uh, two theta value. That means they're the zinc rich shell part. So we're forming a zinc rich core. Uh, coating it with a zinc, uh, sorry, forming a cadmium rich core, coating it with a zinc rich shell. Um, and the interface then as a function of time continues to become more and more diffuse, even after we've reached a kind of saturation of the crystallinity. And from those composition gradient models, if we fit those to these in situ data, we can get this little cartoon on the right hand side, 
which shows you visually how these particles are changing as a function of time. So um, they're starting off as a very red cadmium rich core. They're growing and growing and co getting coated by more and more blue zinc rich shell. And then as a function of time, once the size has pretty much stopped growing, that interface in between the red and the blue gets more and more diffuse. So I'm um, reaching the end of my talk and I'd just like to summarize here. Um, we've uh, discovered essentially the first single step synthesis of these mixed component, uh, quite demonstrably core shell moth nanoparticles and being able to control their composition through uh, their synthesis uh, parameters, uh, composition and uh, temperature and time. We've also developed this new model to extract structural information on that nanoscale from bulk X-ray diffraction data, and that is underpinned by the transmission electron microscopy, microscope images that, that Sean took. Um, this formation in situ diffraction tells us it relies on the difference in the crystallization kinetics of the cadmium rich and the zinc rich, rich metal organic framework. Um, and looking towards the future, maybe if we can understand that crystallization a little bit better um, and use it to form new microstructures, we can start to tailor the moth properties beyond just the, the bulk average crystal structure that we're, that we're typically familiar with. So there, I'd just like to end uh, with a series of acknowledgements. There are a lot of people involved in that work, um, in, in particular at Oxford, where I was mentored by Andrew Goodwin for a few years. Um, Kieran Orr, who, who did a lot of the, um, the second part of the work, um, also duh, 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 at Diamond Light Source, uh, several beamline scientists, in particular at I-12, uh, Nya and uh, Oksana helped a lot with, with the in situ results that I showed. Um, and uh, several different collaborators through the years also who have been instrumental in, in getting to this stage. And also uh, a whole host of funders, in particular Birmingham, who support me in my present position. And thank you very much for all your attention. Mm -hmm.